So this morning we're talking about weighing anchor, weighing anchor, and it's not like you put it on a scale to see how much it weighs. It's a nautical term. It just means pull in the anchor, lift the anchor up off the bottom. <laughs> and if you if you can kind of you know imagine, I I, I love the movie uh, The Bounty with Mel Gibson for the scenery. I love the scenery in it. You know, it is just so so absolutely beautiful. This this. Uh, old sailing ship and it's at anchor in this uh, lagoon somewhere in paradise you know in, in Tahiti I guess or somewhere around there it's just so spectacular and so beautiful and there's a there's a kind of a theme running through the movie you know where they're, they're preparing to sail back to England and they're, the ship is being prepared and the sails are being prepared and the, the cargo is being prepared everything is being prepared they have an idea, the captain had an idea of where, where they were going to be going. They were preparing for the trip. But before that ship can leave, before that ship can leave the lagoon, before it can leave the safety of the harbor, there's one last thing that it must do. And it must weigh anchor. They must lift that anchor up. They must pull it up out of the mud. They have a big, they have a big winch on the, on the uh, boat. They, have, they they turn it in a circle and they hoist that anchor up and they stow it away and then you know in all of the sailing movies there's, then there's the scene where the ship is underway and it's making a wake you know and the waves are splashing against the bow and just get get yourself captured into that beauty of the scene but it never would have happened if they didn't weigh that anchor. They would still be stuck with the sails full of wind, <laughs> with, with the ship trying to move forward but being tethered by the anchor line. It would probably just go in circles, spinning around. You have to weigh the anchor. You have to let go. So we each have dreams, we each have aspirations. We, if you sit down with people and say, you know, if you could do anything you wanted to do, what would it be? What would it be? And many times people can't get there with you right away because they're thinking about all the reasons why they can't, you know. Well, I, I can't, I've, I've got a mortgage to pay off, I've, I've got kids to send to college, I've got this, I've got that. See, if all that were taken care of, if all that were taken care of, what would you do? Well, I don't have the money to do, if, if you had the money, if, if Saturday night you picked the six numbers, you know, and, and you were a multi-bazillionaire, what would you do? What would you do? And this was an exercise that I used to do frequently to, to kind of help people get in touch with their aspirations, get in touch with what their heart wants to do, you know. Not what their accountant wants them to do, what their heart wants to do. And it's interesting because many times people say, well, I would travel. If I had all the money that there was in the world, I would just travel. I would, I would get on one of those around-the-world cruises, and I would go someplace, and I would get off the ship for a while, and maybe I would live here or there, and then when the ship came back, I would get on it and go someplace else. And say, that's wonderful, wonderful. After you're done traveling, after you're done traveling, what would you do? What would you do? See, and then we start to get into what is it that my heart really wants to do? Not my head, my heart. When I was a, a little guy, nine or ten years old, you know, TV was was relatively new medium in the households. It had the the technology had been around for a while, but both the broadcast stations and and the affordable receivers were a while coming. It's interesting if you look at how technology evolves. It takes a long time sometimes for things to uh, things to become mainstream. Uh, just as an example, back in 1987, I was part of a field trial, one of the first trials where we were putting um, broadband speeds, well, it, it wouldn't be broadband speeds today, but it was faster internet connections, and and also fiber to the home. They had broadband speeds. We had a we had a trial with fiber fiber optics to the home, 
in Lake Mary, Florida, and uh, one with the uh, ISDN out in Phoenix, and I was working the Phoenix job. And I went to a, 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 a panel discussion where they had where they had these PhDs talking about what could we possibly do with, with higher speed <laughs> data connection. Now, remind you, this is before the Internet. There was no Internet. We had this tremendous speed, and the question was, well, what are you going to do with that? And I remember back in 87, these two gentlemen discussing, they said, you know, it's possible that you could have a little black box that sits next to your TV set, and through that little black box, you could call up a catalog of any movie that's ever been recorded and you could you could have that movie downloaded to that little black box and then you could watch it because you'd pay a fee but you could watch it and after you've watched it it would erase itself from the memory of this little black box and they said the technology to do that existed in 1987 now of course it took us 25 years before we actually had um, a commercial solution where we could do things like that in our home but it wasn't it wasn't a problem with the technology i'm sure the technology today is much much advanced to where it was in 1987 but the problem was with getting everyone to change getting everyone to change the people who owned the copyrights to the movies was was the primary uh, the primary hold up they were, they they didn't want their movies to be streamed like that. They couldn't figure out how to get paid, you know. But eventually all of that worked out. But my point is, is that the dream, the vision, the idea that that could be done preceded the evolution, the actual coming into our experience. So when I was a little guy, like 9 or 10 years old, TV, broadcast TV was a real, didn't have cable TV, broadcast TV was a relatively new medium. And the producers of television program were trying all kinds of things to see what, what are we going to do with this? What can we do with this? You know, They had uh, three-act dramas, we had Craft Playhouse, we had Playhouse 90, we had things where they tried to, to, to take a theatrical production and somehow um, make it work on TV. And the shows tended to have more more of a storyline. Now we get reality TV because they don't have to pay writers. So we get reality TV and people watch it and it sells commercials and that suits the business purpose of the, of the of the TV station. But TV TV shows tended to to have stories and they tended to be drawing from some of the the popular writers of the day. And of course, this was all black and white. I remember the first time I ever saw Call of Television, I was about 13 years old. I was like, wow, wow, what is that? You know, the NBC Peacock in, in all its glory. But one program that uh, my dad used to watch all the time, and it came from, um, it was created by James Michener, the, the author of Hawaii. And it was called Adventures in Paradise. And it was, it was you know, kind of a, this this dream world, this fantasy world that people would look at and say, "Oh boy, I wish I wish I could do that. I wish I, were, I wish I were in that." And what it was about is this: this man who was a Korean War veteran who moved to the South Pacific, and he bought this big sailboat, like an eighty-foot sailboat, and he had this little business of just sailing this boat from island to island, and he would carry cargo and he would carry interesting passengers and of course there was always a story that went with it and there was a romance with people falling in love kind of like fantasy fantasy island um or some kind of a mystery you know and as he would sail around he would pick up the clues and those kind of things but interspersed in between all of this uh, this drama this drama that was created for television were these scenes of this beautiful boat at sea you know just being pushed along by the wind, just just slightly, slightly heeling over, leaning over to the side just a little bit, the, kind of riding the waves and, and splashing up and down. And my dad used to watch that every week. Every, every time it was on, he would watch that. You know, and that was that was his mental escape from from the drudgery of riding the subways into New York City and going to work. You know, 
what would that be like to be free? And I think that's the button that it pushed. You know, people want to be free. We all want to feel our freedom. We're told that we're free. You have free will and choice. We want to be free. But many of us don't experience that. Many of us are kind of, you know, tied to our anchor. We're kind of kind of stuck. So my dad would kind of watch this every week, and I would sit on the floor in front of the couch and lean with my back to the couch, you know, and he would be sitting up on the couch, and he, and he would be watching that, and we would watch this, this beautiful sailboat. And then a few years later, maybe, maybe five years later, um, he always had some sort of a boat, and at this time he had it was a, a 30-foot powerboat, and we kept it in a slip in a, in a boatyard, and the next slip over was a sailboat, very much like the one that we had watched on TV. A little bit smaller, but it's two families owned it. And, and the, uh, the, the, uh, two, of, two of the four people were dentists in Manhattan. And they worked their dental practice during the week. And then on Friday nights, they would come to, down to the boatyard. They would start up the engine. They would let loose the dock lines, and they would head out to sea, you know. There's a couple of bridges that you had to go under to get from where we were out to the Atlantic Ocean. But, uh, and, of course, the masts were so tall that the, they had to swing those bridges for this boat. But they would go out, and they would sail for Friday night, Saturday, Sunday. And then late, late Sunday night, if we happened to be at the boatyard late on Sunday night, you could see them coming back in. They had spent the weekend out at sea sailing up and down the coast of Long Island or New Jersey, back and forth be between the two. And, <laughs> and that was kind of like, an, you know, another, another kind of reminder of the freedom. Here were, here were these people who were doing, doing, sort of doing the things that Captain Adam Troy on Adventures in Paradise was doing. So I think, I think the message there, I think what we get from that is there's something that appeals to us in these stories of people who are free, people who are uh, unburdened, if you will. They're not tied down. They're not tied by an anchor. They're not tied by a dock line. And they are free to go and live their lives as they choose to live, free to pursue the adventure, free to, to set their sails and, and go wherever it is that they want to go. And I think there's a part in most of us that, that looks at those things, and it may not be sailboats for everybody, you know. But I think there's a part of us that looks around and we see, we see situations or we see jobs or we see people doing things and we go, oh, wow, I would love to do that. I would, I, you know, I would pay them if I could do that. I, could, I would pay them if I could go and do that. And what we, what we want to remember, what we want to think of as, as we go into this from a spiritual perspective is that life has created us for joy. Life has created us to express and to experience joy as us and through us. See, life, life was not meant to be a struggle. Stuart Wilde wrote a little booklet by that title. Life was never meant to be a struggle. The human experience has been a struggle. And the, and the human experience has created the belief that life should be a struggle and it should be a test and it should be hard and and we have been made to eat our bread by the sweat of our brow and to bear our children in pain because of the original sin but you have to keep in mind that this is an explanation of how life works this is this is a world view of how life works but people who lived in a desert People who are trying to grow food in a desert. People who came from a very, very rough situation, a very, very rough environment. And their worldview and their projection onto what, what this thing called God is and what this thing called God must be like is harsh. It is harsh. But that's not the only worldview, you see. There are people who lived in paradise, people who lived 
on the on the islands. People who lived lush <coughs> in jungles, where if they if they needed something to eat, they could pick it off a nearby tree, or if they lived on an island, they could go down to the lagoon and they could catch a fish, and and life was abundant and it was teeming. And those people had a totally different worldview. And they still do. And their worldview is is that God is good, and life is good, and life is joyful, and life is a celebration. Even in even in Australia, which in itself could be a very harsh environment, the Aboriginal people had a saying that this is a holiday. Life is a holiday, a vacation. That we come from the dream time and we come here to play and to and to have fun and to be joyful and then we go back to the dream time. See, this is a totally different worldview than we come here to take a pass fail test that's going to determine where for eternity our soul is going to be. So the first thing we have to do, you have to, we have to decide is what worldview are you going to line up with and why? Why are you going to do that? Why are you going to choose one over the other? And my belief and my worldview is, is, that, is that life is good, is that life is joy. Now, we don't always have that experience, but that doesn't mean that that potential is gone. That doesn't mean that the, <laughs> that doesn't mean that it can't be. See, I think one thing we have to keep in mind is is that the rules and the regulations of the societies in which we live are created by human beings, created by human beings. And we as human beings sometimes make things a whole lot more difficult than they need to be because we start with the world view that life is supposed to be difficult, so we make it that way. But in reality, it doesn't have to be that hard. It doesn't have to be that way. But those are the rules of the system. Those are the rules that that culture has accepted, perhaps not, not overtly, perhaps not consciously, but nevertheless, we accept it, that that's the way that it is. So what we want to keep in mind is, is as I've been talking for these last couple of weeks, kind of the the um, the difference between the human experience and the spiritual experience. The human experience is one thing. The spiritual experience has the human experience, but the spiritual experience expands beyond that. Is more than that. Okay. And what we have come to to establish in our society is is that the human experience is is the real experience and it is it is ultimately the only experience and that is the one that we need to focus our attention on how to be how to have a better human life and Joel Goldsmith tells us this in in, in some of his works he says when we first start to to truly believe that there's this this thing called God what by whatever whatever vision comes to us, whatever our opinion of what God is. Ernest Holmes says, your opinion of God constitutes your religion. Whatever we think this thing called God is, whether it be a kind and loving God or whether it be a God who <clears throat> who's kind of cranky and you have to you have to kind of figure out how to please it and beg and plead in order to get good things sent to you. But what tends to happen is is the first the first step in our awakening is people are trying to to bring God down into their human lives to create a better human life for them. And that's what we're trying to trying to use God to have a better human experience. And we do that as human beings, we tend to do that. Right? And I think the Janis Joplin song kind of captured that, you know. Buy me a Mercedes Benz. But as Goldsmith tells us, if you if you walk into an office building in a big city and you want to go to an office that's on the 28th floor, you press the button for the elevator and when you get in the elevator you press 28 and then what happens is the elevator goes up. What doesn't happen is is the building doesn't go down around the elevator. The building doesn't descend into a big hole in the ground until 28 is even with the street level where your elevator is. And he's saying you don't. We're, we're trying to call God down to our level. And what we need to do is, is we need to elevate our consciousness 
to the spiritual level, to the spiritual level. So at the human level, we look at things and we say, well, this is the way they work and you work hard and you get paid and, and, and all of those things. But yet the spirit can remain unfulfilled. <clears throat> the spirit is still longing or it is still dreaming. Right? Then the poets say our, our reach should exceed our grasp or what's a heaven for, you know. Why do, why do we have this ability to imagine? Why do we have this ability to create this vision of something that does not exist in, in our experience yet, but we can see it in our mind's eye and we can create it? So the first thing that I wanted to address here is sometimes the reason people don't, don't pull anchor and move is, is they don't feel worthy to do that. Who am I that I should go and have this adventure? Who am I that I should go and do these things, you know? When, when we're supposed to struggle and eat our bread by the sweat of our brow, who am I? And here's, here's the point I want to make with that, is if we are looking at this from the point of view of what we are going to get out of it, then yes, we can be selfish. But we have to start thinking of ourselves as God's instrument of love. And what is it that we are going to give? What is it that we are going to express? What is the joy that we are going to bring wherever we go? That is why we are here, to, to, to be that instrument of love and to be that instrument of joy. And now that puts it in a whole different perspective. Because if we are sitting here at anchor and not moving because we think that it would be selfish to do so, we come to realize that it is more selfish to stay at anchor than to go out and do the thing that we were we were <laughs> made to do or, or built to do or our heart wants to do. Who who <laughs> who brings more joy into the room? Somebody who's living a joyful life or somebody who's living a life of drudgery, you know? So we have to recognize then that life has created us to fulfill itself through us, to, to enjoy its life through us. And the divine never, never does anything out of need. Right? That which is everything, that which has everything, that which knows everything, that which can do everything, does not do anything out of need. So why then would it do anything out of joy, out of joy? It lives and creates out of joy. We are its instruments of joy. So first thing we want to do is kind of, if, we, if we're not already there, we want to reframe our worldview. And instead of saying, I am here to, to struggle through the challenges that life throws at me and to pass all of these tests that life is going to give me so that after I die, then I can, I can live a joyful life. We want to back that up and say we are God's instrument of joy now. We are God's instrument of love now. We are God's instrument of peace now. And we are here to share that. We are here to find a way for us to express it. And we are here to share that. <clears throat> See, and now it becomes kind of our duty, if you will. Maybe duty is too harsh a word. Okay? But it becomes our purpose. And it becomes a valid purpose. <clears throat> and we can remove any guilt from saying, who am I? Who am I to want to pull up and go sail that boat around the Pacific when other people have to ride the subways and go to work? And we might say, who am I not to do the joyful, loving, kind things that I have been created to do because I believe in the need for struggle. I believe in the need for struggle. So we got got to let go of that anchor, that one anchor, which is I believe that life is supposed to be a struggle. Now the second part might be, well, okay, I, I, you know, Maybe life's not supposed to be a struggle, but I don't know exactly where I would go and what I would do. And again, this is kind of a belief in I've got to do it all myself. See, this is kind of a belief of the ego I. And what we must come to understand is there's a part of us that already knows. There's a part of us that does know. There's a part of us that knows 
what makes our heart leap. There's a part of us that knows what brings us joy. And we have available to us, because we are part of the whole, we have available to us whatever it is that we need to know. Dr. Holmes tells us if you needed to know something and the only person on the planet who knew what you needed to know was in a jungle somewhere, you know, doing research somewhere in a jungle far off in the middle of nowhere. And if you truly believed that that information was yours, then it would come to you. It would come to you. I would go a step further and say, it doesn't matter where that person is because that information is known in divine mind, in collective unconscious, if you want to call it that. And that information will come to you, will come into your field of awareness. Tesla's method of invention was, according to him, more of a revelation. You know, he had an intention to know something, and that information somehow appeared to him. I spent, uh, I spent many years working on uh, large computer systems. <laughs> when they were in trouble, that's when I would go. And I didn't know I didn't know how a lot of these things worked. I, you know, I mean, down at the down at the circuit level or the or the zero and the one code level, I understood what code was. I understood what hardware was. But if I looked at a particular circuit, <clears throat> I hadn't designed it. I didn't know what it did. But I didn't have to. I didn't have to. I knew what the system was supposed to do, and I knew what the system was doing. And I knew what the difference between the two was. And I was able to pick up the phone and, and call and say, I need the person who knows how to do this, and I need the person who knows how to do that, and I need this person who knows how to do the other thing. And we'll get together and we'll figure this out. The knowledge exists somewhere. The knowledge exists somewhere. In um, Napoleon Hill's book, Think and Grow Rich, he says, you know, you know, <laughs> Your ideas are going to require more than you already know. So you're going to have to bring that information in from somewhere. That's what he calls creating your mastermind group. So just understand that every great idea, every great idea needs, needs more information. I think it was Robert Schuller who said that if, if, if your ideas aren't so big that you you don't need anybody else, then your ideas aren't big enough. See, it, your idea causes us to stretch. It causes us to grow. It causes us to reach out and see other people as that expression of God that we know ourselves to be. It causes us to, to love. It causes us to trust. So whatever information is required, that information already exists somewhere, and it is available to us through the divine mind. It is available to us through other people. It is available to us through the internet, through research, but it is available. So if the anchor that's holding us back is, I don't have enough information or I don't know, let go of that. That information exists. Another big one that holds people back is resources. I don't have the money to do that. I don't know how I'm going to afford to do that. You know, it it takes it takes a lot of money to to do that. I think I've mentioned this to you before, but I'll mention it again because it's such a good example. At one point in my career, uh, I was involved in product development, so we would we would get money from the <clears throat> corporation, and we would invest that money in research and development projects to bring some new product to create a new product and bring a new product to the field. So I had a, a group of product managers who did that. And <clears throat> we were spending a lot of money every year. We were spending over $100 million of the company's money every year. So there's a lot of money changing hands. Because we didn't get to keep much of it, but a lot of it changed hands. And one fellow I was talking to, um, he, we were talking about these kind of things. And he said what he really wanted to do was he really wanted to be able to, to build a... Um, a mission, a soup kitchen, a, a, a facility that would serve homeless people. He felt that that was what he was being uh, called to do. 
And I asked him, I said, well, what's keeping you from doing it? He says, oh, he says, it would take a couple million dollars to do that. <clears throat> and I don't have a couple million dollars. So I said, tell me about the products that you're bringing to market. And he started to tell me about those. And I said, how much of that is your money? He said, none. I told him, I said, the money is there. The money exists somewhere. There's money out there somewhere. You just have to let go of the anchor that says, I have to do it myself. And you have to allow that to flow to you, to flow through you. You know, we plant we plant the tomato plant out in the yard, and I, I've i never heard the seed say, well, where are the nutrients going to come from? Where's the water going to come from? We just put the seed in the ground, and it has the ability to draw to itself whatever it needs. And we have to think of these ideas that we get, these divine ideas of what it is that we can and, and should be doing with our life as seeds, you see. And we plant those seeds into the fertile soil of universal mind. And we allow them to attract to themselves everything they need. And again, this is about getting the ego out of the way. This is about getting the me and the I out of the way and saying, well, I have to do this. I have to make this happen. I have to bring these things to myself. I have to plant the seed. I have to, I have to truly desire this to come to fruition, and I have to cooperate with the things work, and I have to plant that seed. So there is something for each of us to do. There is an adventure for us to go on. There is something that would make our hearts dance if we could do it. And we have to believe that it's okay for us to do that. We have to believe that in doing that, somehow life is expressing and experiencing more joy through us than it would otherwise. And that is our purpose for being. We have to take time to allow ourselves to, to discover what that is. And we have to move forward. And I think one of the biggest things that holds people back can be summed up in one word, which is fear. Fear. Fear of the unknown. Fear of change, fear of failure, and a bigger one, which is fear of success, but fear, but fear. So if we're afraid of change, I think we have to recognize that change is occurring whether we are afraid of it or not. The bodies we have now are not the bodies that we had years ago. The body that I have now is not the body of that nine-year-old boy sitting on the floor watching Adventures in Paradise with my dad. The body that I have now is not the same body I had two years ago. And someday our bodies will be gone completely, but we will still be. So we have to become comfortable with the idea that in order to live we must constantly change and change is constantly occurring and change is nothing to be afraid of because the divine mind is always thinking change is always occurring always there's nothing stagnant in, in, in God's universe everything is in motion and it's in motion in more ways than we can comprehend you know we used to think in three dimensions, and then Einstein gave us the fourth. And now we're finding out that maybe there's ten, or maybe there's twelve, or whatever, whatever they're talking about today. Change is life. We are part of life. We cannot be afraid to change. What is the opposite of fear? And it's love love and what is love it is the experience of unity the experience of oneness so if we if we have any bit of fear we have to be honest with ourselves <laughs> yeah let's say yeah i don't know if i'm really quite sure i want to do that we have to learn 
to trust. Dr. Holmes says, when we learn how to trust, we shall be happy. We have to learn how to trust that, that the divine love that has created us to go out and express its life to, to our fullest ability, that that divine love that has created us to do that, that we are one with it, and it does not want us to fail. All of God is for me. None of God is against me. And let that be your affirmation. Let that be your mantra. All of God is for me. None of God is against me. If we truly understand that we are one with everyone, we are one with all things, we are one with the Creator, we are one with the abundance of the universe, then there's nothing to fear. There's nothing to fear. What remains to be done is we need to weigh anchor. We need to weigh anchor and we need to begin. We need to begin at once. What is the saying? Whatever you can you can dream to do, begin at once. Because once you do, it's like an invisible power comes to your side and begins helping you. And I think that that's probably the last, the last anchor we're going to talk about today. It's just getting started. Just beginning. You know, we can sit and we can plan and we can think and we can look at the weather maps and we can look at the charts and we can, we can calculate how much fuel is on the boat. We can calculate how much drinking water is on the boat. We can do all those things and we can do them forever. But at some point we have to pull that anchor and begin and begin. And whatever comes up along the way to know that there's, we're capable of dealing with it, of handling it that the resources that we need appear as they are needed. I've studied a lot in the last few years uh, since I retired. You know, I've been involved in, in uh, working at the TV studio and, uh, and working on, uh, on a film. And I wish I could remember who it was. It might have been might have been Warren Beatty who said it, and I don't know who he was talking to. But they were talking about becoming a director. This person had been an actor in front of the camera, and they were talking about switching sides and, and starting to direct. And this older, more experienced director said, uh, what's holding you back? And this younger person started uh, started explaining. And the older director said, so you, you don't think you're ready yet, is that it? And the younger person said, yes, I, that's it, I don't think I'm ready. And the older director said, you're never going to think you're ready, never. He said, I don't think I'm ready and I've been doing this for years. You have to go do it, you have to start, you have to begin. And whatever comes up along the way, you have to trust, you have to trust that you'll be able to deal with it. You'll be able to handle it. That you will get through it. And, you know, and there's an old saying, once begun is half done. We have to start. We have to start. We have to get going. So I invite you this week, I invite you, ask yourselves, what is it that brings you the most joy? What is it, what is it that allows you to experience the most joy? And when you are experiencing that joy, what is it that your soul is giving? What is it that you are giving in that joyful moment? And then ask yourselves, what different ways are there that I can give more of this? Whatever it is, whatever this is, how can I give more of this? And then can you trust that if that is what your heart's desire is, if that is how divine love is experiencing more of itself as you by giving through you that the ways and the means and the opportunities already exist already exist and then it is simply your role to wake up to pay attention to stop believing that that anchor can't be moved 
to stop believing in the need for struggle, to stop believing in the need for lack or limitation of any kind, whether it be money or ideas or ability or ability. Reframe, reframe your worldview, put on your little captain's hat. <clears throat> Recognize that you are on an adventure of your soul. This life is an adventure of your soul. That you are meant to move and be joyful in many different ways. And you are open and receptive to discovering what that is and living it. And now it's time to weigh anchor and do it. And so it is. Let's see what I did here. So it looks like I left the book with the closing treatment in the other room. So we will have our own closing treatment today. As we come together today in this closing, we wish to feel loved. We wish to feel at one with. We wish to feel, and we do feel, that the love of God is right here where we are. It is constantly whispering to us what it is that we are to do to go forth and to celebrate its life and its love and its joy. And the divine knows no obstacles, no barriers, no boundaries, no blocks. It just knows what it shall have and it has it. It speaks its word and the law makes it so. And it has created us in its image and likeness. So today we speak our word that divine love is revealing to us right now our heart's desire. What it is that allows us to express more love and more joy. That divine love is bringing to us and has already provided us with and continues to provide us with all of the ideas, all of the money, all of the resources, all of the helpmates. We accept our life's purpose. We accept ourselves as God's instruments of joy. And we release and let go of every and any anchor we have ever let hold us back. We release this treatment knowing so certainly it is done that we say together, and so it is.